It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I want to reach as many people as possible, and you can help me doing that by leaving a review where you listen to our podcast. And Krista has a recent review that she's going to read. Hi, Krista. Hello. Um, We want to thank Apple Podcast user Clickster for this review. It says, besides my parents and wife, no other person has had a greater impact on my future. His no-nonsense style of investing and frugal living has allowed me to change the trajectory of my financial future. I would trust Clark with my life. Wow. Don't do that. Don't do that. (laughs) But thank you for the kind words. All right. Today's podcast, I want to talk about something coming ahead, where the power company where you live may be offering you a special deal that's maybe special for them, not for you. And we talk about whether these deals pass the quote unquote smell test. And then another question for you, when you're trying to figure out in your 401k, your Roth IRA, you have an investment account, you're better off in mutual funds or index funds, or their uh, index fund cousin or a sibling, an ETF index fund index. We're going to talk about what over time proves to be generally the best. And I want to start talking about the power companies. So power companies have a difficult time right now. We're in a transition of sources of power as we use a continuing mix of coal, natural gas, some parts of the country, hydro, solar, wind. Uh, We'll eventually probably include geothermal in this. It's become much more complicated to provide those kilowatts for your power. And in some parts of the country, we have a problem with transmission lines where we don't have enough transmission capacity. So it's become a much more complicated business providing power to homes, businesses, factories, the rest. And so power companies are trying to shift some of the capacity burden to you and me. And they're doing so with teasers where they say, hey, We're going to offer you this incredible deal on power if you, certain times of the day, will get power nearly for free in return for other times of the day paying a much, much higher price than you do now. Well, these time-of-use meters, also with an additional wrinkle in certain parts of the country, where the power company is trying to prevent brownouts or blackouts, are offering you incentives where they take control of, as an example, your air conditioner and make you sweat a little when their capacity goes down, when they just don't have enough capacity left. So there's multiple things out there. The problem for you and me as consumers with busy lives Can you truly manage the power use in your house? Because if you go to one of these time of use plans and you're not able to actively manage your use of power in your house, all you're doing is almost certainly raising what you pay for power at your house. Okay, so isn't that weird? So they may say, okay, from uh, 11 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock in the morning, We're going to charge you a penny a kilowatt for your power. And you're like, man, that's like free. And it is virtually free power. But the rest of the 24 hours, you're paying potentially a giant rate per kilowatt hour. And when's almost all power being used? The rest of those 24 hours. So some people are in a position based on how they work, how they live, whatever, that this works great for you. Let's say you have an electric vehicle. So you set it up where it only charges in those hours where power is virtually free. Then for you, it's a steal, right? Well, you also have to think about when are you doing laundry? When are you doing other things in your home 
And if you're now working at home as a hybrid worker or whatever, you're not having to go to the office, your power use during peak demand times may be much higher than it was when you used to go to an office. So you're going to get, potentially if you haven't yet, you will get fancy uh, brochures, colorful brochures in the mail, traditional mail. You'll get email notifications offering you these time of use rate plans. But just know it is the rare individual who ends up paying the same or less than before. Most people with time of use meters end up paying more. So you got to know yourself, your own life situation before you accept one of these supposedly bargain offers that turn out usually to be anything but a bargain. Now, the second wrinkle I mentioned is getting a discount for allowing a power company to take control of your air conditioning when they're peaking, meaning peaking is when they're running out of available kilowatts and then you're facing the potential in your area or in your state of brownouts or blackouts which could happen a number of places during a heat wave in particular. So I am happy to participate in that, and I've done so before. It's not available to me now where I live. But I did have that, and I was happy to do it. And what would happen when demand was going crazy, they would turn my air conditioners off for a period of time, air conditioner off for a period of time, and then I would get hot in the house, but... I got a reward every time they needed to do that. I got a cash bonus, and it helped the power grid stay more reliable. That's a case where my self-interest benefited, and I was doing something good for the overall community. That I'm fine with, because it was only, other than sweating a little, it was just a straight-out win for me and for others. Krista? Okay. You ever done anything like that? I have not, no. You're Uh, not willing to... Sweat to keep the power system reliable. Is that what you're telling me? Mm -mm. I do like being comfortable. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, Just like to do energy efficient things in the house. So maybe it's more efficient. Dave in Ohio says, I recently found a couple of really good Black Friday type of deals on Amazon. I went through the purchase process, but had both orders canceled by the vendor. Am I just out of luck or is there anything I can do? Okay. So here's the thing with Amazon. Um, is that Amazon, for 70% of what it sells, is basically eBay. You know, Amazon is a marketplace for more than two-thirds of the goods sold on the site. They are a listing service. They may also be providing fulfillment. So you're not even thinking that you're not really buying from Amazon. Amazon is only fulfilling the order. They may even be delivering it with Amazon delivery trucks but you're buying from a third party. And so they are running their own business under the umbrella of Amazon. So if you get in your mind with most sellers, and it doesn't give a lot of disclosure, but if you look closely at a listing, it'll say this is being sold by uh, Krista's non-fulfillment uh, Black Friday deal site <laughs> or whatever it says. No, it'll, it'll say, you know, you're buying from Clark's whatever or whatever the seller is. It'll say that. And then you know you're not buying from Amazon because remember, you have a very uh, relatively small chance that what you're buying is actually coming from Amazon itself. So it is uh, Amazon's lending an air of credibility to that seller. And I wanted to say something about this that I have not said in a while. A lot of times sellers are selling on multiple um, sites. They may be selling on eBay in addition to Amazon. They may be selling on Walmart Plus in addition to Amazon. And the same seller will sell things at different prices on those different sites. I've discovered that most often that same seller is selling the cheapest on eBay of the three outlets. And so if you're not hooked into, well, I want to have delivery in three days or two days or whatever, that is a big advantage you have specifically with Amazon, 
um, some of the walmart.com stuff gets delivered same day now if that's not as important to you comparison shop on ebay because you don't have uh, any kind of service guarantee from amazon with those items you're buying that are third party so if time is not of the essence buy it at the site that's cheapest that's a long way of saying amazon's not going to do anything for you because the third party sellers did not honor the black friday deals and i just want to say the easiest way to see who the seller is is underneath the price on amazon underneath the add to cart or buy now it always says ships from and sold by so you know if amazon has it in their possession and it's sold by a third party or if it's actually shipped from the third party so that's a really yeah easy so way to this one out. like you're looking at it says ships from amazon but it's actually not sold by amazon it's sold says from the amazon. seller yeah Brian in Ohio says, I'm going to Scotland for a vacation in 2026, and I'm saving up for it. My wait, 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 wait. This is someone who plans their life so thoroughly. Brian, I'm so impressed. Four years out, you know you're going to go to Scotland? It's awesome. I don't know where I'm going to be this afternoon. <laughs> so Brian says, uh, my question is, how should I get money, and where's, what's the best, safest place to pay for stuff? Okay, so... As far as, uh, you know, in when you go in four years, Scotland may still be on the pound, but by then they may be on the euro because Scotland wants to break away from the United Kingdom, uh, potentially. But uh, the key with money is to use a credit card that has no foreign currency uh, junk fees. Those are very widely available now. And then you're getting... Uh, the banker's buying rate, which is a wholesale rate, on the exchange of money, you're getting a really great deal on money as you need it as you purchase things. Scotland, if you go back not that many years ago, credit cards were not widely accepted. They are now. Uh, in addition, if you need walking around money, you want to have an ATM card from a financial institution that allows fee-free ATM withdrawals, which there are many now available to do that too, because then you're able to get money uh, walking around currency, pounds, euros, whatever. You're able to get them uh, without any foreign currency junk fee. And those are the best ways for you to do actual in-store purchasing with a credit card or getting cash from an ATM as you need walking around cash. And make sure you tell your bank um, or your credit card com company, whoever it is, that you're going to be in Scotland. So yeah, you if you there. don't do a, f a foreign travel alert, then you go to use your credit card, you go to use your debit card, uh, you know, go to the ATM, whatever, and you're going to get declined. And that's a hassle. Paula in Pennsylvania says, I received a notice from a law firm about a legal settlement with Experian because Experian had been reporting some residential addresses as non-residential, which caused difficulties obtaining credit. I was one of those people. The law firm sent me a form to fill out to receive my part of the settlement. They require the last four digits of my social security number. Is it safe for me to provide this to them? So is it safe? Anytime you give out your social security information, even the last four, you're creating potential danger down the road with your identity. Uh, in this case, it is necessary because they're likely, potentially, if the settlement's large enough to each person, they're going to have to issue a 1099. And so, for that reason, it is, your question was, is it safe? No. Anytime you hand out your social security number, you are reducing the level of safety in your life from identity theft. Is it a legitimate use of providing your social security number? Yes. So what you're judging is you're judging the potential risk of yet one more place that your uh, social security number is out there, in this case, your last four, and at the same time, you're creating the uh, reality that money is going to come to you. So one is a possibility of problems. The other is the reality of money coming. So in that case, it is a judgment that I think leans towards giving the last four so you get your money. 
And if you've not frozen your credit yet with Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, do that because that's the best line of defense we have against the problems that come with identity theft. And credit freeze is free. It's relatively quick to set up now and very painless to temporarily thaw when you do need to apply for credit. It affects none of the credit you already have. And one of our most popular pages on Clark.com is our Freeze Your Credit Guide. Clark.com slash credit freeze, which we've been talking about for 20 years, I guess. Um, so coming up, I'm going to talk about when you are investing, where are your dollars most efficiently working for you, getting you long-term the best return? We're going to talk about that. Hope springs eternal. And there are companies well-meaning that market, that build and market mutual funds that are what are known as actively managed where professional managers, generally unbelievably bright men and women who work their tails off, attempt to come up with portfolios of stocks or bonds, or stocks and bonds, depending on the type of mutual fund. And they, with both their head and their heart, believe that they are going to be able to design a fund that because of their expertise, their design, their stock and bond picking, that they're going to be able to outperform the market. Well, first time research was done on this was 50 years ago. And what did the research find? That in spite of the best efforts of these unbelievably bright people, that they could not beat just a simple index fund. Now, you go back then, there weren't their cousins or siblings, ETFs, exchange traded funds, which are another way people buy an index. An index is simply owning uh, segments of the stock market or the bond market. The most well known is the S&P 500, where you own the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States. But there are a variety. I'm really into the total stock market where you own thousands of companies, little pieces of them. And then there are bond equivalents and all that. Well, time after time, the math is tested over longer periods of time. Do you make more money just buying the list of, fun list of stocks or do you do better with somebody who, again, is, is either an individual brainiac or a team of incredible minds who are picking and choosing individual items, this company, that company, the other company, and building a fund of those companies that they pick that they think are going to do the best over a period of time? And over and over again, just simply buying that index fund wins. In fact, I just saw the latest analysis of it. There was a, a very thorough story written in the New York Times about it. And they tested 2,132 different funds at S&P Dow Jones. And this is really crazy. In the most recent period they tested, out of the 2,132 funds that are people actually picking individual stocks and bonds, zero, zero beat a simple index fund. Now, why is it that a simple index fund, where all you're doing is you're trying to be average, you're just trying to ride with the markets up? or lately down, it's because of the expenses involved in having all those brainiacs run an actively managed fund. You're paying much higher fees. And if you've listened to me for any number of years, you always hear my obsession about the fees on your investments. You know, how we have a system set up where we rip off school teachers in the United States on their retirement plans 
with expenses that can be as much as 100 times what you may have in a traditional employer 401k. And so teachers end up with much less money in retirement, saving the same amount of money as anybody else in America would be saving in a plan, which to me is a national scandal. And I talk about 529 college savings plans and how much it matters that you put your money in the lowest cost plans. And then here we have this latest study by S&P Dow Jones finding yet again that doing the lowest cost funds, which are index funds, will over time make you more money than even investments chosen by the brightest minds in the investment community in the United States and the world. And so that's why, over and over again, I talk about my favorite children, Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity, because everything's about low cost, in the case of Fidelity, with their zero funds, zero cost on going into index funds. And that means every dollar you put to work is working for you. The thing over time is you want to invest in things that have no commission, and that have extremely low expenses, or in the case of Fidelity with the zeros, no expenses, so that every penny you have working is working for you, not for somebody else. The other aspect of this is that when you go in index funds, they're far more favorable if you're doing a traditional investment account instead of a retirement account like a Roth IRA, 401k, something like that. And Christy, your first question comes into this area of types of investment accounts. It does. This one's from Steve in Missouri. He says, is it ever advisable to invest in a taxable brokerage account over a tax advantaged account such as a 401k? I currently contribute to my 401k up to the company match and max out my Roth IRA. I'm trying to decide if I should put my leftover money at the end of each month in the 401k or start a taxable brokerage account so I can have money in three different tax buckets. What are your thoughts? So this is a very, very interesting question that has uh, two key wrinkles to it. One, if the 401k you're offered by your employer offers the option of you doing a Roth 401k, the Roth 401k is superior to you doing a traditional investment account. In either case, you're putting in after-tax dollars. But the difference is a regular investment account, when you sell those investments, you're going to be subject to long-term capital gains, which is a favorable tax rate, but you're still paying a tax. In the case of a Roth 401k, you're putting the money in. It grows through the years. When you spend the money in retirement, you spend it all tax-free. So if your employer offers the Roth 401k option, that is clearly superior to the investment account. Now, where's the second wrinkle? What if you are not planning to work till normal retirement age? Then having money, even though it will be taxed at this more favorable capital gains tax rate, having money in a traditional investment account is a potential significant advantage to you because the investment account money, as long as you hold things in there a year or more, you qualify for the preferred tax rate and you have this money that is available to you at any age, not retirement age. So you'd have to have a couple of things going on before doing a traditional investment account would be a better idea than contributing more to that 401k. The good news today, overwhelmingly, we have a access now at most employers to the Roth version of the 401k. So if you have that and you're not intending a significantly early retirement, that's where you put more money. From Scott in South Carolina, what are the pitfalls of annuities for retirement investments? Okay. Um, how long is this podcast <laughs> going to be? Is this going to be like two hours? All right. I will summarize this. Uh, annuities are a disaster for retirement. They are pushed so hard by non-fiduciary commission salespeople. What's a non-fiduciary? That's someone who is allowed to sell you stuff that's better for them than it is for you. 
the reason they push annuities so hard is annuities have massive, gigantic, humongous expenses and commissions. And they may also have something embedded in them called surrender charges, which means you could have money with them for up to 15 years and you divorce the insurance company, you decide to pull your money out of it, you could then be hit with massive fees just for pulling your money out. They stink. There's a family show. I won't say any of the words they actually do, which is much more severe than stink. Um, annuities are a product that is sold, not bought, meaning that people buy them because the salesperson was good enough to convince you, smart enough, able enough to convince you that this is some kind of El Dorado. Because the whole pitch with the annuity garbage is that you won't lose money, that you'll get part of what the returns may be in the market, but if the market goes way down, you're not going to lose money. That's the pitch. Okay, the reality is the annuity contract will typically be about 175 pages, and 174 and a half of those pages are things that are not good for you. And the conditions where that annuity will never lose money are so limited by all the exceptions in that contract that they are dirtbag products. Am I being strong enough there? I think Is so. Is that pretty clear? Mm -hmm. Dirtbag products? Okay. So, for the long haul, doing low-cost traditional retirement investing far outruns annuities. Now, there are certain types, and annuities are a cuss word on our show, but there are certain types of annuities that can make sense in your life that are annuities that are purchased at the time of retirement or for later in retirement. One is a longevity annuity, uh, and I'm not going to get into all the explanations of these. And another is an immediate payout annuity where you're basically creating your own secure pension in retirement. But annuities to accumulate money for retirement are a hideous product, or is, whichever, are. are. They are terrible for you, and don't do it. If you really want to do something like that, then start uh, – driving down the road with no seatbelt, ignore all stoplights, just drive like that because that's kind of what you're doing with your money saving it for retirement. It is the equivalent of extreme reckless driving on the roads. Or go see a fiduciary. And if yes, one of those always you want a fiduciary, which is somebody who legally is required to do what is in your best interest. John in Georgia says, do you recommend buying additional insurance from a rental car company? I never have. I uh, never have done that. Uh, not only have I not recommended it, I've never done it. So the, the car rental company at the counter, the, the salespeople at the counter, the rental car agents, they many times are under extreme pressure to get you to buy all the ancillary pseudo insurance coverages and that's where all the profit is for the car rental company. But before you rent a car is when you find out if you're covered otherwise. So you want to check with your own automobile insurer and see if you're covered for temporary use of a rental car. Almost always you are for a period of up to 14, 15, or 30 days. Second, I want you to have a credit card that provides uh, coverage in addition to what you're offered by your own automobile insurance. And that one, two allows you to eliminate anything you might consider buying from the car rental agency. Uh, I have a list at Clark.com, if you travel regularly, of the best credit cards for you to carry so that you can avoid buying any of the stuff you're being offered at the car rental counter. And that article is titled, titled Credit Card Rental Insurance, What You Need to Know. Another thing, always shoot video with your phone and or take pictures of the rental car that you are renting, any marks on it, dents, anything like that, 
you want to document that on your phone before you leave. When you return, you again shoot video or take pictures so that if later the car rental agency alleges that you have damaged the vehicle, you have the documentation that you did nothing at all to that vehicle because otherwise that could be a real hassle if not a meaningful expense. So I want to thank you so much for being with us today. I want to tell you we are in the midst of our 32nd year of Clark's Christmas Kids, our annual campaign to see that children in foster care have gifts to open Christmas morning. If you have the ability to help us out with our 32nd year of Clark's Christmas Kids, please go to clarkschristmaskids.com and you'll see the Donate Now button and make a difference in the life of a foster child this Christmas. Thank you very much.